Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unstuff America. I'm your host, Andrew Mellon. I'm so excited that you're all back with us for this episode, and I'm particularly excited because we have a guest from north of the border, Vanessa Udelman, who will be sharing her experiences with us, and I'm delighted. We are, uh, we are professional friends and also friend friends, so it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about Vanessa and her practice and get a perspective on um, how at least one Canadian views what's going on in the U.S. these days. So with that, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome Vanessa to the show. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Andrew. Great to be here. <laughs> It's great to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for work, what your home life's like. Do you live alone with other people? Just some basic info so people can get a background on you and your relationship with stuff. Sure. So I live in a busy household. I'm married. I um, just celebrated my 12th year anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, well, that's great. And my husband and I have two sons, Aaron and Joshua, who are nine and 11 so we run a very, very busy household with two boys who eat a lot of food. Um, they play competitive baseball, so we're running around a lot. I call myself Uber Schlepp because I'm always driving somebody to some sport. Um, and so that's me personally. In terms of business, Andrew, I uh, run a, a business I've been running for six years called Mosaic People Development. And I go into organizations and I develop their leaders. That's awesome. That's great. And so. Um uh, how about your parents? Are your folks alive? Yes, I have. My, my parents are both alive. Yeah. Excellent. How's their health? Um, not great. They're in their 70s now and have had some health concerns. So yeah. I'd say I'm fairly typical in terms of being a sense, this, in the sandwich generation. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that many of our listeners are, can relate to that. I mean, I think that there's a lot of folks that um, are in that sandwich generation with um, growing children and at the same time aging parents and some of them perhaps both of them are still alive one of them is alive and all of the challenges that come with managing a household if you if you will backwards towards your your family your immediate family and at the same time the responsibility is going upward towards the previous generation so it it only um, I think adds to folks challenges around time and stuff when we add in those aging parents who are still possibly very vital and at the same time needing more of our attention and support in managing their affairs possibly, right? Oh, for sure. And, you know, right now my parents are, are well. Two years ago, my mother had a near-death experience um, through a surgery that almost, uh, she didn't make it through, but she did. So, you know, that was a challenging time period also juggling hospital visits for six months, you know, children, family business. So yeah. you're absolutely right. It does add extra pressure onto our lives. Yep. And I think it's something for folks to think about when, uh, when we are thinking about how we're going to manage our time and our stuff to be as expansive in that understanding as we can be so that we, I think we tend to lowball the responsibilities. And now, the focus of the podcast and certainly the work that I do with folks in the world is to simplify, simplify, simplify. And at the same time, we need to be mindful that some stuff is as simple as it can be and it's still complicated. So that when you're approaching your life with a degree of awareness, with a degree of mindfulness, you are cutting yourself the appropriate kind of slack. You're not letting yourself off the hook saying, oh, you know, it doesn't matter or I'm completely overwhelmed and I'm just lost in the narrative of too much stuff, but that you're accurately reflecting these are the given circumstances and this is what I have to manage. Yeah, and it, it, great point. And I think in terms of um, my philosophy around managing it all, I don't actually use the term work-life balance anymore because I really actually don't think there's such a thing. There I'm isn't. Sure. It's an oxymoron. Work-life juggle. Yeah. <laughs> What am I juggling right now? Which ball is higher in the air? Um, and to me, that feels, it just feels like a more successful way of living. Because mm -hmm. time balance, I think, is a constant struggle. Yeah, well, and I think the idea of literally a teeter-totter that you're trying to get perfectly balanced on a fulcrum is a ridiculous concept. You'll never get it to be static there. So whether the idea of juggling, we talk about it here in my practice about work-life integration, because 
there's no point in keeping score. There are times when you are going to be heavy on the work side. There's times when you're going to be heavy on the life side. And if everything is meshing together in a way that doesn't make you crazy and uncomfortable, yeah. then really, if, the, if scorekeeping is only going to make you come out short and make you upset, you should probably just resign from that activity because you're never going to win and be, be satisfied. So cool. So tell me, what are you really passionate about? So I'm very passionate about my work. I love what I do. I um, have been developing leaders for 18 years. Wow. And I kind of had a very awful personal experience. Oh boy, probably about eight years ago where I was working in an organization, managing the organizational development and learning department there. And I was a high performer and I was doing really well. And I, you know, got exceeded in all my performance reviews and I had the best manager and a great budget and a great team and all that sort of stuff. And while I was on maternity leave with my second son, I got a new boss. And it was a very soul-sucking experience. She took away all my responsibilities, yelled at me in front of people, chastised me. It was just a very, I, I, the only way I can describe it, and is soul-sucking experience. And what I realized through that experience was I was someone who went from a high performer, someone who loved work to someone who was disengaged within four to five months. And I was the same person in the same job, in the same company, and the only thing that changed was my leader. Wow. So it was such an interesting experience. So for me, I really am passionate about developing conscious leaders. Um, and because I really feel like leaders make or break people's experience at work. And people, you know, you've probably heard people leave their manager, not the company. Right. So leaders really, really set the tone on their team and make or break people's experience. So I, I love what I do and I'm very, very passionate about it. Okay, great. So tell me what really upsets you. What makes you crazy? And let's talk about it on a micro and a macro level, right? So whether it's kids leaving the toilet seat up at home or, you know, leaving doors open or lights on. And then on the macro level, when we think about the world and the places where you see an opportunity to be of greater service beyond the four walls of your home, right? So let's talk about it on both a micro and a macro level. For sure. So um, on a micro level, it's definitely not toilet seats that bother me. I have uh, I live with, you know, two boys. I have two brothers. My husband has a brother. I'm always with boys. So the toilet seat thing, not an issue. <laughs> um, I, you know what bothers me? Okay, so on a micro level, and it's kind of a micro macro thing, is garbage. Garbage. So um, we have so much of it. I think it's sort of part of your unstuffed theme. We, uh, we went to visit some friends recently who live about an hour out of Toronto in a beautiful area near a waterfall. So we went on a hike to the waterfall and littered along this beautiful path was garbage. Oof. And it, that, Andrew, drove me crazy because I'm thinking, how can people care so little about our planet? So with my sons and I, we picked up the garbage and threw it away. That's excellent. Yeah. It's unfortunate that you had to do it, but it's great that you, yeah, I mean, I do that all the time when I'm off hiking and I just find garbage. I, I typically either carry a bag with me or I just stuff it in. If I'm wearing cargo shorts, I'll just stuff it in my pockets and figure I'll get rid of it when we get back there. But I can't, I can't walk past this trash. It's unfortunate that the people that were here before me were that unconscious, but it just, it's just, it doesn't belong there, you know, so... That's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause us for one second here just because uh, Alexa is talking to me in the other room and I don't know if I don't, want it to, I don't want it to bleed into our audio. So I'll be right back. Stay right where you are. I'm going to note it's um, 502. Great. Perfect. All right. And we're back. So yes, so trash is one of those things. I mean, it, trash at home, trash out in the world is a, that's great. So thank you so much for sharing that with me and with us. Tell me on a scale from one to 10, with one being the least organized and 10 being the most organized, where you would put yourself on that scale when you think about your own personal organization and it, you know, life, work, all of it, just overall, where, what would you grade yourself? I'm really organized. I give myself a seven. Awesome. Very good. Solid seven, yeah. All right. And then tell me um, of uh, the last thing that you purchased that wasn't food or consumables. What was it, if you can remember, the last thing that you purchased? 
Well, in terms of big things, I'm not, I'm not a shoe person or purse person or a jewelry person. That stuff doesn't do it for me, but I got a new car. Okay. And I love my new car. I, I have a Honda Pilot. It seats, uh, it's an eight seater. And what I love about my new car, I got a sunroof, which I okay. love. <laughs> and, and we were away on vacation recently with some friends. And I just love that I'm, I could say, hey, everybody pile into the car. Let's all go together. To me, my, my car, it's kind of a funny thing, but it like, I, I'm so valued community. And so for me, my car expands into my valued community. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. So you would say that it was worth it. I mean, that it, that it improved the quality of your life and it's worth it. Love it. Great. So to be clear, you know, I, um, while I am not a minimalist, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful about consumption. And I also realize that people are going to need to buy things at, at various times in their life. And so part of the inquiry is just encouraging folks to be reflective and think, because it's very easy, certainly with plastic to pull it out and purchase something and bring it home and then be disappointed possibly at, oh, you know, now that it's here, is it really... Has it done anything to improve the quality of my life? So the question is really an opportunity for us to explore that. And in your case, it clearly, it, it's right in alignment with your values. It's a necessary thing. I mean, you live in an urban area. You need, you need transportation. It, it can't just be public transportation because of your responsibilities with your family. And, and, it's, and it allows you to actually bring your community to you. So that's great. Would you say that you have more things, more stuff than you need and use when you think about your home, your garage, your office? Uh, how do you, how do you feel in your relationship with stuff? Do you think there's too much? Do you think oh, there's not enough? Way too much stuff. Oh, I mean, first of all, with kids, you know, we've got a basement filled with, with stuff. 98% of it they don't use. Okay. Um, in my office, I'm a collector of books. I've just got copious amounts of books that I am paying to get rid of. Clothing is another issue. Um, you know, we have seasons in, in Toronto. So, uh, you know, there's the winter stuff and summer stuff that goes upstairs and downstairs. Yep. You know, depending on the season. And the kitchen's filled with... Uh, yeah, oh, way too much stuff, Andrew. And to be honest, I don't like clutter. So it's a big thing. I don't like living around all the stuff, to be really honest. All right. So here's the first Unstuff America challenge that I'm going to present to you. Okay. If I could show you how, in at least one area of your life, that you could let go of some stuff, would you be willing to donate it to a local thrift store or shelter? Would you be willing to pass it along, knowing that it's not going to end up in landfill? Because that's garbage. I mean, literally, trash is the last place that we want anything to end up. So many things that folks have that, is, that would be considered surplus for you would be essential for somebody else. So would you be willing if I could show you one, one, at least one thing that you could let go of in your life that you would be willing to pass it along? You know what? I would love that. And I'd love more than one. I'd love to a list of 10. <laughs> Excellent. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that might have to be a future episode, but we can take on at least one area. So uh, when you think about it, where, where, where do you feel stuck around letting something go? And, and we'll take that on today. You know what? Okay, I'm going to go with clothes. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, I'm deciding between books and clothes, but I have a closet, a section of my closet with formal wear that I've worn once. A wedding from a friend eight years ago. A wedding of my cousin where I had to wear a dress of X color. Uh, things I've worn once that are in impeccable shape that I will never wear again. Okay. What, what, what do I do with them? So you can take it to, um, if you want to try to get some money for it, I'll bet that there are uh, consignment shops in Toronto that would be happy to sell that. There's lots uh, of consignment shops here, yeah. Yeah, so I would suggest that you first contact a few of those. Yeah. And if they don't do, um, some of them might only do couture, or they might only do really name brand designer clothing. And others might be happy for any formal wear that they can get their hands on. So I would say um, this, is my, this, this is my instructions to you. And of course, by, by extension to anybody who's listening to the podcast, I would say set your timer for 20 minutes and get on the internet and do some research. And the quickest thing to do is pull up Google and type in formal wear consignment shop or formal wear resell and put in your zip code or your postal code. 
and I promise you, you'll get some hits and you can either visit the websites and or pick up the phone and call those places. And I, I would suggest, I'm going to back up. The first thing I would do is pull them out, take one photo of each garment that you're ready to let go of. So that when you get somebody on the phone, if they have any questions about what it is, you can easily email them off to them and you're prepared to do that because I want to make this really easy for you and by extension, anybody who's listening. So step one, take the photographs of the garment. You don't have to go crazy. We're not, it's not a website that you're, we're not going to try to sell them ourselves. So I think one good photo and maybe a close up of the label, if there's a label in it, then do your Google search, then pick up the phone, call the folks, then put them in your car and take them over there. It's that simple. All right. Four steps to decluttering my closet. Oh my yep. God, I feel so good to do that. Excellent. Good. So let's talk about time a little bit. Tell, tell me where in the day do you think, um, or the week, the month, when you think about time and losing time, you know, sometimes we, we have that experience where we come to, right? We, we come back to consciousness, to mindfulness, and we think, oh my God, where have I been? I don't know where I've been, but I, I have, it's not like an alcoholic blackout, but you feel like I, I can't account for the last 45 minutes. I have no idea what just happened. So I'm wondering if you, when you think about, um, and, and that's one form of it. The other form of it is, of course, just plowing down, doing something, being very focused, but at the same time, blowing off other stuff that possibly could have been done or should have been done in the time frame that you had scheduled. So just in, in, when you think about how you manage and walk through time and space, where do you find the biggest time challenges for yourself? So my challenge is not around wasting time. It's more around not having enough time. Great. Okay. So that's a story because you have the time that you have. So the math is the math. We have 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 168 hours in a week. Yeah. So, and that's, there's no judgment when I say that. I mean, I just understand that I've been doing this for 21 years. I hear from people all the time, too much yeah. stuff, not enough time. It's a, it's a universal thread. So I'm just poking a hole and just going to create a little breathing room for you in that there is, when you aren't clear about the priorities, the mountain of all the things you could be doing, of course, feel overwhelming and that there's too much to do. But when we are clear about values matching our activities, some of the things that we're dragging around that we think it would be great if I did do them, really, they're, they they there's no value added to the quality of your life. They're just things that are obligations or things that you think one should be doing that don't, that don't bring anything to the table, if you will. So, so now, just with that in mind, when you think about not enough time, where, where, what are the things that you're not getting to that you would be getting to if you had more time? Um, well, I would say... You know, I don't work on the weekends. Okay. So I, I am, in terms of values, that's a strong value of mine, that my weekends are my family time. Great. Um, I would say it's probably related to how I spend time in my business. And am I really spending all of my time on the most value-add activities? Um, and really looking at where, as a business owner, I should be spending my time to grow the business. Right. Um, versus outsourcing all of the mini stuff. I think I'm still holding on to some stuff. Um, not, and Andrew, not necessarily because I like it, but because I'm used to doing it and I do it easily. Excellent. I'm and just going to say also, um, whatever you, wherever you just moved to, your sound quality totally improved. So if you could just stay closer to wherever you are, I don't know what just happened, but it, it was a bump up in the, in, the, in the volume of your voice, which is great. So thank you. Okay. Cool. So, um, so there's the thing about uh, work and not n delegating, not letting go of stuff. Yeah. Are there other, uh, so are there things that you have um, not done and felt bad about it? Have you, uh, has there been story there for you around some of these things that you should have let, let go of? If we're looking at the math equation, if there's things that you should have let go of, what are the things possibly that you didn't pick up that 
that maybe there's some story around that as well? Um, well, things that I don't get to is more the house stuff. Okay, that's fine. And do you have somebody coming to uh, take care of the house? Yeah, I do. I do have help. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's that uncluttering that you talked about before. Um, I like things to be clean and I don't like living with clutter and I'd love to get rid of more stuff, but you know, when I'm running my business and I'm spending time with my kids and trying to juggle all of that and my parents and you know, the things we talked about before cleaning up the basement or the garage really is not my priority. Sure. So one of the things that I will say and uh, yeah. totally legit answer. And when we think about spending time with your family and uh, I mean, nobody's ever going to want to clean out the basement, but be sure that your boys aren't going to want to clean out the basement when you're dead. So it could possibly be an activity that all of you went into the basement for, you know, three or four hours over two weekends, knocked it out, cleared it out, got rid of everything, engaged them in the process so that we're building some skills with them because they're totally at that age when they can be learning the organizational triangle and how to apply it. One home for everything, like with like, something in, something out. It's all you need to know about getting organized. One home for everything, like with like, something in, something out. What does like with like mean? So, well, we'll start with one home for everything, which is that everything has one home and only one home. And it doesn't matter what the home is, but it has only one home. It's either in its home or it's in your hand being used. Like with like means all like objects live together. So all the tools live together. All of the cleaning supplies live together. All of your sweaters live together. All of your shoes live together. All of your bags live together. All of your books live together. So that that way, when you're trying to find something, you'll have to one place to find it. And anything that you could possibly want will be there because it can only be one place. Now, the bookshelf is the bookshelf, but basically it's the bookcase is where we're going to find books. It makes things super easy to manage, and it means that within 30 seconds or less, you can find anything that you're looking for anytime, day or night. The third leg of the triangle, something in, something out, is all about achieving stuff equilibrium. It's about having enough of everything that serves you and nothing that doesn't. And so it's a great opportunity. I mean, whether you choose to take it or not, it's a great opportunity to build some muscle with the, with the boys and your husband. And at the same time, give yourself a huge psychic gift of clearing that stuff out. And, and once you do it, the beautiful thing about getting organized is staying organized is really easy because it means when something comes in, something goes out. So it's hard to accumulate if you're living in the third leg of the triangle. It's only when you're not in the third leg of the triangle, when more is coming in than is going out, that clutter starts to build up. So applying one home for everything and like with like in your basement, for example, once you're done with that, you should never have to go back to it again. I'm a firm believer that once and done, as far as this stuff goes, this is... This is not a lifelong process. And, and I'm sort of joking, but sort of not joking when I say that it's true. Because I mean, when, you, when your folks leave and you go into their house, there will be things that you think, oh my gosh, why? Why is this still here? Why did they keep this? And while I'm grieving their loss, why do I have to figure out what to do with this thing? Yeah. So as a, as a parent, always being mindful of what your legacy is for the generations that come after is is paramount to making sure that the quality of your life is improved and also the quality of every generation after you is also improved. It's just, it's about being a right steward. Yeah, I like that idea of doing it with the kids. Yeah. And then a question around one stuff in, one stuff out. Is it uh, an interrelated object? So I buy a new purse, I get rid of a purse? Or is it I buy a new pair of shoes, I get rid of a purse? Uh, I think it's object for object. So if you determine that 14 purses is enough purses to have, that's the number of purses that you have. So the 15th is because you wanted to retire one, not because it was on sale or it was so gorgeous you couldn't leave it at the store or any of those, any of those narrative attached reasons because you've already determined 14 purses is enough purses for any human being to have. And I'm just making up that number. You can, you can easily look in your closet and figure out if this is where the purses live, this is enough purses for me. I don't need any more purses. Yeah. And I don't care what that number is. There's no rule from an organizational point of view that says every adult's allowed to have 14 bags or 17 pairs of shoes or nine sweaters. The space... Right. 
I guarantee it's a lot less than 14. Yeah. <laughs> well, but as you wish, I mean, the yeah. space is doing an excellent job of informing what too much is because when things don't fit on the shelf, when things are stacked up on the floor, that's a clear indicator that there's too much stuff. Sure, sure. Great. All right, so let me ask you, if, um, if I could get you back two hours or more a month, would you, this is the second Unstuff Your Life challenge that I'm going to present to you, would you be willing to volunteer a quarter of that time, whatever the number is, would you be willing to volunteer that time out in your community in some way to help improve it? So we're going to get you, we're going to get you 75 for yourself and 25 that you're going to give away as, uh, you know, uh, sort of payback for the, for the bonus 75 hours, 75% of, 75 of the time. Of course. Excellent. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to ring the bell for that, Yay! for accepting the Unstuff Your Life Challenge, um, the Unstuff America Challenge. So let's, so let's talk about um, too much to do, not enough time to do it. And let's see what we can do to get you at least two hours a month that you can give you some breathing room. Uh, this is what we're gonna do, uh, and it, it's just occurring to me that this is, I think, the best thing to do. I'm gonna ask you to download an app called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L, there's no E in Toggle. Okay. And I'm gonna ask you to time yourself, to, to carry it around, put it, you'll put it on your smartphone, you'll keep it on your computer, and time yourself for the next seven days. Okay. Doing everything that you do, and then we're going to circle back and we're going to talk about the results of that because what you're going to discover is how you're actually spending your time versus how you think you're spending your time. And we're going to find those two hours in that week. I promise you that we're going to find that time for you and then we're going to have you turn it back out into the community. You'll get to keep, as I said, three quarters of it for yourself, but a quarter of it you're going to then give away um, just, to, just to make Toronto a better place, whether it's on your block, your neighborhood, in the city, in the province doesn't matter. All right? Awesome. I'm a firm believer in giving back. So I'm excellent. Love that. Great. So when you hear that when you hear when you heard the expression unstuff America, what did that mean to you? What what came to your mind when you first heard that? Well, I, I think we're all bloated with stuff. I really do. Um, we have too much. We want more. People are con so concerned with keeping up with the Joneses. So to me, it really made me think about the you know, the world that we live in where um, consumerism has such a large and a necessarily large focus. We're, we're stuffed. Our, our bodies are stuffed. Our homes are stuffed. Excellent. And um, that, that's, I, I just think it's unnecessary. I think people need to unstuff. Excellent. I love the, the visual, the metaphor of that. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, and w when you think about activism or being active in the community, what does that mean to you? I mean, how do you think of that? Well, I think activism is critically important. And I think it, activism means different things to, to different people. Sure. Activism to me, so I, I, I volunteer. I am the co-chair for the Toronto South African Film Festival. And why I do that is I was born in South Africa. I immigrated to Toronto when I was seven. I love film. Uh, all the proceeds from the festival go towards a charity that helps kids who are living in impoverished areas of South Africa. So when I think about my personal activism and how I spend my time volunteering and giving back, it's around causes I'm passionate about. Kids, education, the arts. Um, so when I think of activism for people, I always say like, why don't you do something that you love? You love gardening, go help somebody garden. You love, you litter bothers you, go pick up litter. So for me, it doesn't have to be a massive undertaking. It could be, it could even be smiling at someone in the grocery store. Yes. No, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that uh, certainly from my point of view, um, and thank you for sharing that from my point of view, uh, activism happens in lots of different ways and it really is it's again the micro to the macro you could run for public office you could pick up a piece of garbage that didn't make it into a trash can it's really about bringing your awareness and living your values every day both at home and then in the world and um, this idea that for so many of us we are so fortunate the quality of our life compared to a hundred years ago is incomprehensible. The degree of comfort that we enjoy. And 
it doesn't even make us uncomfortable to extend ourselves in the ways that I'm talking about. It's, 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 it's not requiring that much more. And I think the, the more we can engage that conversation and poke a hole in that sense of, I don't want to be uncomfortable or I just want to be comfortable, which is all relative again. It's, it's all based on, on what? I mean, if you have food, clothing, and shelter, I think your comfort is pretty much taken care of at that point. So then really, is it momentary discomfort? Is it like a hangnail uncomfortable? Is it lower back pain uncomfortable? What, which, which kind of a discomfort are we talking about? And when, when you have the ability to ease somebody else's suffering, again, on a micro or macro level, and it really doesn't cost you that much in the scheme of things, it seems crazy to me, to me, that somebody would say no in the face of that, because the extension is so little compared to what we each receive through the nature of our interdependence in developed worlds. So, yeah, and what I would I agree, and what I would add to that is I see because I work with leaders in corporate uh, who are very smart, successful, busy people, and a lot of them, Andrew, are not happy. And what I know about, call it activism, call it give it back, call it volunteerism, is that giving to others makes us happy. Yes. It's such a wonderful, it just, you know, people are living lives, there are little gerbils in a treadmill, and to get yourself out of a treadmill, uh, off that treadmill, and to, to give back, I, I've yet to meet a person who didn't say, wow, giving back felt great. Yeah. So you use the word conscious a lot, you know, living consciously, which I do as well. And I think people should be more conscious about how they're giving back and how they're getting themselves off that little treadmill. Yes. Yeah, I would agree completely. It's, it's so, the dividends that any act of, I don't even want to call it charity. It's just, or generosity. It's really just a natural extension. It's our natural kindness and we are communal animals and, and we are only as vulnerable as our weakest link. So, you know, the pack is not going to make it if somebody is dragging behind us and we think, well, we'll just let them fall behind and something will eat it, but we will be safe because eventually you will be that person and if there's nobody to look out for you because everybody else has been eaten you will have only lived a little longer but the quality of your life will be so greatly diminished by focusing only on your own survival right i mean if the world is a garbage heap and you're the last person standing i don't know that the quality of your life is going to necessarily make having survived whatever happened to get us there something that you want to celebrate because you're by yourself on a pile of trash. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I was um, watching a documentary film yesterday. I'm screening the movies for the South African film festival. And yes. I was watching the documentary. There's something like, I don't know. I'm, don't quote me on this number. 1.5 million people in South Africa living with AIDS. It could have even be higher than that. And the documentary was called positively beautiful. And it's about these five individuals who have AIDS um, and contracted AIDS in, in many different ways. Um, and some of them have children who were born with AIDS. And what's so incredibly moving about this documentary is how positive each of these individuals are. They live in poverty. They've got a potentially deadly disease that they have to face every day and how they don't view it as a death sentence, but as a way to cherish life even more. And it was just so inspiring. Yeah, that's amazing. Really puts things into perspective. Yes, yes. Well, this has been great. So um, the last thing I just want to ask you, is there anything else that you want to share with our fellow unstuffers before we wrap up for today? I would say live consciously and choose wisely. Excellent. Well, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I think that that's excellent. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. I am, uh, I, let people know where they can find out more about you and your work. Where, where can they find out more about you? Sure. My website, my company's called Mosaic People Development. And my website is www.mosaicpd for peopledevelopment.com. 
Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us on Unstuff America, Vanessa. It's been great having you here and uh, I'll look forward to seeing from you, uh, seeing you again and hearing from you about uh, your timer so that we can come up with part two and figure out how we're going to get you that time so you can spend even more time out in the community. All right. Thanks, Andrew. It was lots of fun. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.